Got it. Well, Chris, I'm so excited to have you on the show. This is going to be so much fun. You and I, we've had a chance to really get to know each other here the, the past year and a half. Uh, and, and I've just thoroughly enjoyed your humor, your stories, the just, you know, the, the adventure that you live your life through this, this lens of just, you know, hey, what's next? And how can I, you know, conquer the next thing? And so uh, I'm really excited to really share your story with our audience. Back from, you know, kind of the big days of hockey to, you know, what it is today that you're doing. And so thanks for being on the show. Uh, so glad to ha so great to have you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Let's so see. Oh, do you want me to treat you like I normally treat the media? <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> no, but uh, I do know some funny stories that you've shared with me about things that you've done with the media, uh, <laughs> per particularly a cameraman who kind of got in your way or got in your face at an inopportune time. <laughs> accidentally on purpose <laughs> yes yes I, I don't know if we should have that be a cliffhanger i don't know if you want to get into that uh, uh, we'll, we'll let that marinate out there for a while i like it i like it hey i love seeing the lifestyle investor on your bookshelf right behind you nice yeah. placement great reading material right there oh, i love it well that that always, is very flattering always trying to uh, improve my knowledge love it thank you that's really cool man well, it's neat to know someone that has really played the game of life at such a high level. You know, you, you find, you meet people all throughout life and some people are okay at a certain thing. Some people gain mastery in a certain thing, but you are one of the greatest NHL players. I mean, you, you think about how hard it is to get in the NHL and, you know, I, I've heard your story. I've heard your story from you via um, something cool that we do in Tiger 21 called a portfolio defense, where you get to kind of share your story and share how you got to where you are. And so I know how hard it is to get into the NHL. I know how hard it is to stay healthy and continue playing in the NHL. And then for you to go on and do all the things that you did where, you know, you, you won a Stanley cup, which is the ultimate pinnacle. It's, it's the thing that everyone dreams of. And you, you did that and you were an MVP many times over and you were an Olympian. I mean, you, you lived this life as an NHL player that even NHL players would only or could only dream of. And so I'd love to kind of hear some of your thoughts around that, what it's like, if it was surreal, if it, you know, if you had a vision of that and, and so it wasn't odd for you, you knew that that was going to happen. Yeah. Well, I think, I think you touched on the good parts. <laughs> and as we all know, the glamorous side of things is just that the glamorous side, but there's also the other side, the, the hard work, the sacrifice, the, uh, the discipline and, and things of that nature that help get you there, help keep you there and help elevate you uh, in your career. So uh, it was always a passion of mine to play hockey, play in the NHL. Um, you know, I think you go through stages of you're pretty good and then you match up against players and you're like, all right, I am pretty good now. All right. What's the next step? And you keep hitting these hurdles. And I think a lot of people go wrong is they reach, I want to get to the NHL. And that's their goal. They don't set another goal. They don't say, okay, well, I'm here. All right. I want to be a top four defenseman. I want to be a top two, two line forward. I want to be, you know, a 50 goal scorer. I want to be a, you know, a Norris trophy winner. I want to, they don't keep setting new goals and they're just, happy to be there and happy to be along for the ride. And, you know, I think early on in my life, I figured you got to keep setting goals. And once, once you attain those goals, you got to keep moving the ladder and moving the rung on the ladder to, to get higher and, and try to achieve uh, those, those higher goals to push yourself. Uh, I think too often we don't push ourselves enough. And, and maybe I went even further and pushed myself too hard or too far, but um, you need to be able to push yourself and, and then create discipline and boundaries and, and what you're willing to sacrifice and not willing to sacrifice to be successful. And, you know, I would say when you look at the greats of, of any game or any sport, uh, sacrifice, discipline, and work ethic are the three 
most critical things that they go through that allow them to get to where they are. Talent is obviously inherent and a part of it, but without those first three things, the talent doesn't really matter. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. And, and obviously you've got to be ultra committed. You, you, you have to eat, breathe, sleep hockey or whatever the thing is to become a true professional, true expert, in your case, a hall of famer, an Olympian, uh, a met, you know, multiple time MVP. So quick question for you. So I remember you sharing a stat, uh, when you were talking about, you know, getting into the NHL, what, what was that stat? How hard is it to get to actually make it into the NHL? Yeah. So when I was, uh, when I had just got into the NHL, they, they did a, just a stat of, of Ontario. I'm from a small town in Northwestern Ontario, but they took Ontario as a whole because of Toronto being the, the Mecca that it is. And I think that it was something along the lines of there's a hundred thousand, uh, minor hockey kids playing of that hundred thousand, you know, 5,000 play triple a hockey of that 5,000, you know, 500 get drafted into the OHL, let's say, which is the Ontario hockey league, junior hockey. And of those 500, you know, 50 of them might get drafted. And of those 50, five might play a game in the NHL. And of those five, one might have a long career in the NHL. So you start breaking it down and, and looking at percentages and looking at how it all plays out. And then you look at the league and go, okay, well, that guy's been in the league 10 years and he doesn't look like he's going anywhere. And you start mapping out the openings and things that there's not a lot of openings every year. And so, you know, you got all these first round picks and all these players signing new contracts and free agents and all this stuff. Uh, how do you get your in and, and then how do you take advantage of it? And then how do you stay there? And then all these things that transpire afterwards and from a statistical standpoint uh i think it's to play professional sports in general it's like winning the lottery yeah there's no doubt in there. fact this reminds me of one of my all-time favorite movies and one of my favorite lines from that movie uh so top gun so you're the one you know, and, and truly you're the one. I mean, it's, that's incredible because not only does it take it, like, not only is it this hard to get there, Chris, but on top of that, you have to stay healthy. So a lot of people, they are, they're, they're good enough to keep playing, but they can't stay healthy. A lot of people, they, you know, they actually aren't good enough to compete with the next generation of athlete that comes in the following year or two or three years down uh, and, and you can see a big gap in their game versus the new young, hungry, in shape um, athlete that hasn't yet been injured and beat up the way that, you know, the professionals have. And so it's amazing that you were able to play such a gruesome sport. I mean, there are tons of injuries. This is a rough sport that you can play it for so many years. How many years were you a pro hockey player? 19 years. Uh, I had while I was playing, I had 13 surgeries. Uh, and then two knee surgeries post. And then I recently just had knee replacement surgery to hopefully remedy the, the last part so that I don't have to do that ever again. Wow. That is intense. And, uh, you know, I, I've seen some of the scars, some of the wounds uh, that, that you've shown me. And uh, hold on, let me show no. <laughs> <laughs> It's not for the faint of heart. That's for sure. No, uh, I mean, man, but what's cool is you're going to go down in history. You already have as one of the greatest defensemen of all time of all, um, you know, just the history of the NHL. And I got a chance to really experience how beloved you were because I lived in St. Louis for a good part of my early career. And so, I mean, people just adored you. The fans there loved you. And so I'm sure that there's this interesting relationship with the fans, you know, where people love you, then you get kicked out, then they're mad at you. You go to a new place. They haven't warmed up to you yet. Or, you know, talk us through what that's like. Cause there, I know there's energy that you feed off of and, but as a general rule, you were loved, not just loved, beloved. Beloved and early on was booed and hated. <laughs> <laughs> because as you said, when you come into a new place, I was traded, he, traded to St. Louis in 1995 as a young 20 year old. 
uh, and was traded for a fan favorite in Brendan Shanahan. And I got booed every, every game. I was hated because I was the one <laughs> who got traded for the guy, <laughs> the other one. And uh, so, you know, it's like anything else, you know, sacrifice discipline, but also adversity. You know, you're going to, you're going to hit those forks in the road and then you can cave and crumble or you can push through and, and find a way and, and become successful. And it certainly wasn't easy that first year. Uh, there was a lot of uh, sleepless nights, a lot of painful memories and a, a lot of painful games, but uh, uh, that, that particular time in my life certainly made me stronger and, and gave me more character and, and more uh, strength to push through the difficult moments in life that you're ultimately going to face as you get married, have kids and go through a family process and all, and all the rest of that. And, and then, you know, when you started making investments and doing decisions of that caliber, you need to start relying on a lot of those decision-making skills and, and a lot of things that uh, you went through early on in your life that ultimately help uh, guide and steer you. Yeah, Chris, you have such uh, an incredible life and story. And I love that, unlike most people, you don't know it, you can't find it. With you, there's just so much like out there because you're <laughs> such a big name. So if you really want to get to know the, you know, the Chris Pronger that I know, uh, you can see the highlight reels and, and all the different things. And um, what's so crazy is just how... Um, intimidating of a guy you were on the ice like people I think were afraid of you and what I mean the the number of people that you just took out was incredible and I know you had this reputation of like don't don't mess with me uh and I I'm, I've got to imagine there weren't that many people that um existed where maybe you felt that way I feel like you were the guy taking people out which is cool. And then I, of course I get a chance to know you off the ice, uh, which is nice. And you're a big teddy bear and nice. Although I can tell your guy, I would never want to uh, offend because you tower over me. I would never want to get checked by you or, you know, uh, I, I mean, that just seems like you would crush people. Yeah. You know what? It, it's funny. Cause when you, when you, when I would meet people off the ice or meet fans in other cities or whatever, they want to hate you. <laughs> they want to be like, man, I didn't think you'd be so nice. I'm like, well, I'm playing a game. Like that's how I play the game. And this is who I am off the ice. And, you know, people think that it's like WWE, like, Oh, this is who you are your whole life in, in and amongst your whole life. So, you know, I think once people kind of get to know you off the ice and, uh, you know, outside of the arena, you know, I learned early on that I had to play a certain way and I had to compete at a, at a high level to bring out the best in myself and therefore bring out the best in my teammates. But off the ice, almost to a person, you know, whether it's myself or any other teammate or player I play against or what have you, you know, we, we all play our own games in, in certain ways, but off the ice, I can't tell you how many people are like, oh my God, I can't believe so-and-so was in, was he, he was the nicest guy ever. And all, you know, he fought 50 times last year and you get, <laughs> you know, so-and-so, oh my God, you're so mean out there, but man, you're so nice. And I'm like, that's the game. And, you know, people would always be like, I can't, these two guys fought each other today and they're going for a beer now. You know, like <laughs> people don't understand how that works. And it's like, listen, it's a game. We're getting paid to win a game. You know, at the end of the day, you're being paid to win. You're being paid to play the game, but really you're being paid to win. And competitive juices get going and, you know, what happens on the ice is going to happen on the ice. Yeah. And so, you know, really it's just the hard part, I think, for some people and where they struggle is they take the persona or they pay, take the game back home with them and they can't differentiate the two and they can't step out of that lifestyle or step out of, that persona and they struggle yeah it's like the mixed martial arts fighters that trash talk each other to the end of the earth and then after the fight they're like hugging like hey man nice job that was so yeah. great yeah. and then some of them do go out for beers together which is great you know 
so it's it is funny because for you there is an incredible contrast like i know you as this nice happy jolly uh you know guy that just loves to hang out and loves to tell stories and you know just likes to have a good time um but you are definitely the opposite of that you are a beast on the ice and i will tell you what if i were on the ice and obviously you tower over me i'd be skating away from you as fast as humanly possible and i would not do anything to ever offend you i would be one of those people so uh, yeah, it, it, it's fun watching the highlight reels though. Let me tell you now you had an incredible, uh, let's call it an incredibly scary moment, uh, on the ice and man, was I, I mean, I got chills when I watched this and you talked about this, you know, in, in hey, our, your portfolio. It wasn't a heart attack. It was an arrhythmia. It was an arrhythmia. That's right. <laughs> yes. We learned that. <laughs> From our friend, yeah. our, our medical doctor, who actually yeah. is so smart. Garhang is so smart. He became a doctor, a medical doctor, just so that he had the ability to do it, not because he actually wanted to practice it. He just wanted to know it that well, which is incredible. Yeah. Um, I just love how smart and sophisticated and incredibly gifted our Tiger 21 community is. We, I feel very blessed, and I'm so glad you're part of it. But let, let's talk about this scary moment because life almost ended uh, on the ice. You got hit with a puck in the heart, like a slap shot that, you know, just someone hitting the puck as hard as they possibly could. It literally hit you in the heart. And I, <laughs> and, and I saw you go down. Walk us through that. Yeah. So we were playing a playoff game in Detroit and, uh, defenseman got the puck and I went out to block the shot and it happens in little league a lot. I blocked the shot and it hit me directly in the heart. And what happened was my heart was in between heartbeats. So when the puck hit my heart, it triggered something in my brain to basically say, okay, we, the heartbeat, I skipped one heartbeat and I got hit and it hurt. And I was like, all right, you're in Detroit. I'm like, do not let these people see you laying on the ground. So I'm like, all right, cover the puck up, get a whistle. And then I'm like, okay, hey, get up and get to the bench. Cause I knew I was in our corner and the, the bench was like, I don't know, 30 feet away. So in my head, I'm saying, get up. And I think I'm getting up, but I black out and you can see I, my eyes are kind of out of it. And I stand up and I go to skate to the bench and down I go. And to our good friend's point, I had an arrhythmia where it's called commotio cordis. My heartbeat skipped one beat, and that's how much oxygen gets pushed through your body in one heartbeat. I didn't have enough oxygen, and down I went. Wow. And so and I woke up in the middle of Joe Lewis Arena, <laughs> staring <laughs> up at the rafters and looking at all the banners and remembering, okay, I was in the corner. And now I'm at center ice in between the two benches with my shirt cut open and they doing all kinds of stuff to me. And I think they had the. Poof. Yeah. I mean, that has to going. Be so it was, uh, it was a pretty scary moment at the time. I was pretty, I was 23, I think. And I, I didn't, I didn't really know what was going on and wasn't really paying too much attention to it. So I got to the hospital. They started monitoring me. I wore a, a heart monitor for 24 hours and then uh, played the next game. <laughs> yeah, that's unbelievable. Uh, probably had, I, had, I, had it happened in my 30s, let's say, I probably wouldn't have played. I probably would have been like, oh, I need to figure this out. But I was, you know, early 20s and just, you know, you're invincible and, you know, I just, I want to play. Short-term decisions. Yeah, in the younger yeah exactly. years, right? <laughs> How exactly. does this serve me right now? I'm a hockey player. Let me get, get, get out right. there and make it happen. That's right. Yeah. Well, you are um, like me and so many other hard charging entrepreneurs that whatever it is that you're going to do, you're going to do it to your best ability and you're going to just take off. You're going to go, go, go. And that's really how I see you. While you were a hockey professional, you just took off and you charged and you did everything that you could uh, to serve your team, uh, to you know, lead to the championships and everything that you were able to do. And what I love is that you've been able to transition very seamlessly, at least it appears very seamlessly, where most athletes, based on the, the athletes I know, and I know a good number of athletes, 
they have a very hard time with that transition because there's a lot of ego tied in being a professional athlete. Like the identity is, Hey, I'm an athlete versus I am a person. I'm a family man. I'm, you know, what, whatever it is uh, that, that truly could be, or should be kind of the focal point and that being an athlete is just like one ancillary component of it. And so you've been able to kind of move pivot as an investor, as an entrepreneur, you know, building out a business with your wife, Lauren. So it's really cool to see. I'm curious what that transition was like for you, though. What was it hard? Was there an ego that you had to let go of? Um, was it as seamless as it looks like it was? Yeah, I was never I was never a big fan of being called Chris, the hockey player. Uh, you know, there's so much more to life and so much more to myself and to, to, you know, what I bring to the table than just being Chris, the hockey player. Yeah. That's was my, was my job at some point and was a passion. It was something that I, but you know, that's three hours of your day. And, and to your point, talking about investing and talking about, uh, I was always fairly involved in, in a lot of investing decisions. I wasn't tracking. I don't, I still don't track things day to day and really follow my portfolio, so to speak, but I know where things are and I know what I'm invested in and things of that nature. And, and just trying to pay attention and read books and uh, use your time wisely when you're not on the ice or when you're not preparing and you're not doing all the things uh, is just really trying to keep current and stay up to date on what's going on in the world. Um, I, I do think that's really where a lot of athletes struggle and where they really can't get past the I'm an athlete. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm Joe Blow, the hockey player. I'm Joe Blow, the football player, baseball player, whatever. They they begin to believe that's their identity and they really struggle with A, when you retire, you're no longer famous because you're not you're not on TV. You're not on you're not doing interviews. People can't see your face every day. You kind of, you know, slide off into the sunset. Uh, and, and some people really struggle with that and others uh, take off and they enjoy that. They, they don't like the notoriety or they didn't like it and they want to kind of just do their own thing and, um, you know, look at 2.0 or 3.0 or whatever it's going to be. And so for me, it was, you know, being, being smart and, and being a sponge and learning about investing, learning about being an entrepreneur, learning about business, learning about uh, other things that interested me while I was playing. Uh, while still being focused on my career and knowing that that's the breadwinner and that's what I'm good at, but also knowing that at some point my career is over and I'm going to be a young man and what's next and how do I get there and what's going to get me there. Yeah, you have such a, a cool story, such a cool transition. It was really inspiring to see what you've done financially because, um, as I said, I know a lot of professional athletes. And um, one of the things that I notice, you know, at first for athletes, they often think that because they made it, now their income is going to be that way for the rest of their life or for a long stretch. Whereas most athletes, they actually don't yeah. last past the first or second year. So yeah. you get into the professionals of whatever that league is, most don't even, they're not even still a professional athlete the year after, and then it even decreases more than that two years after. And so the income that it was really isn't what it was. And then you have the athletes that did make a lot of money, but they didn't take it seriously on, you know, managing it. They left it to someone else or they just spent it like crazy thinking that more was going to come. And um, I know we both know uh, a lot of athletes that have blown all their money or most of their money or a lot of their money. And so it was inspiring for me to see how a guy like you, who, I mean, you assemble, I mean, you had a 19 year career and you were one of the highest paid, you know, hockey players. And it's neat to see that you were able to keep that and, and invest it and compound it. And um, you, you've done something that most athletes have never done. You've done something that most people have never done. And it's cool seeing you say, Hey, instead of just sitting around and doing nothing, um, I mean, you could be sipping, you know, margarita margaritas and pina coladas at the beach. I mean, you own a travel company for goodness sakes. Uh, <laughs> you could do that, but th that's not who you are. 
but you could, you don't need to work. That's where it, I think it's exciting because you're spending your time on something that you value that's important to you. And so you and Lauren started this, you know, boutique luxury travel company and a lot of, you know, athletes and professionals uh, use your company to book incredible travel. Our, our um, Tiger 21 chapter is using your company to book this incredible trip, a, a trip later this month um, to Cabo San Lucas, uh, just kind of, you know, top of the line all the way A to Z. And uh, I'd love for you to share kind of the purpose, the passion behind starting this travel company and kind of what that looks like today. Cause you guys do some cool trips. Yeah. You know, really the, this has been the, the baby for my wife and, and something that's been in the back of her, her head since she was a young kid. And uh, her dad was diagnosed with stage four colon cancer was given a 10% chance to live. And with that uh, looked at his wife and the kids and said, I want to travel the world for as long as I'm on earth. Uh, and that first summer when the kids got out of school, they went off to Europe for two months and, uh, they, you know, saw all of Europe and he was off his chemo and radiation and, and she got to see him full of passion and life and, and joy and, and really just a sponge learning all about new culture and, and culinary and adventure. And, and that, that really left a mark at a, at a young age of six to her and they came back home. And he started planning the next next trip, all the while getting pounded with chemo and radiation, and was a shell of himself, and and really was was beaten down, but fighting for his life, and chose Asia for their next trip, and and wanted to learn more about holistic healing methods and transcendental meditation and and uh, acupuncture and a lot of the Eastern medicine and a lot of the hallmarks that we look at now, and it's kind of merged in. 40 plus years ago, he was really at the forefront of, of kind of looking at that as, as a means to using that as a way to fight for his life, waiting for Western medicine to catch up. And he would immerse himself in the jungle for two or three weeks with a medicine man. And they would go off with uh, looking at the Great Wall of China and the different sights and sounds of Asia. And, you know, he, he was just using travel as a tool to fight for his life and, and learn more about the world and what it could do for him and uh and really the healing powers of travel and uh got back home two months later a radical new surgery had uh had been formed and he got it and two years later was given a clean bill of health and never had cancer again so uh you know that really left a, a mark on my wife at the age of six and seven of what what travel can do for your spirits the mind body spirit the healing powers of travel all that and and so uh she really they traveled, you know, the rest of her time uh, growing up as a kid. And uh, when we got together, I always wondered why I didn't travel more. And I was at the peak of my career and training hard every summer and not really getting a chance to, you know, enjoy my spoils, if you will, and, and get out and see the world. And uh, she always was wondering why we didn't travel more. And I said, well, I, I'm, I'm spending two or three months training, preparing, eating a certain way, lifting weights, doing all the cardio, all that stuff. And, you know, 23, 24 years ago, the hospitality space was pretty small as it relates to health and wellness. And so she would source properties and things of that nature. And then when social media kicked on my final year, you know, my final end of my career in Philly, uh, she had a little social media account, a little private account with friends and family that followed and some athletes and some entertainers and whatnot. And they were always asking her, well, where do you source these properties? How do you find them? And so she started just helping people out, you know, as a friend, just here, setting up trips and, you know, 20, 30 trips later, the light bulb moment goes off like, okay, there's something here. There's that trust factor, that bond, that ability to connect with people and understand what they're going through, what they're, what they're needing. And, but at the same time, I get hurt. Her mom gets breast cancer. Her dad has a debilitating stroke and gets paralyzed in his right side. And uh, you know, we have three young kids at home. So from a timing perspective, it wasn't right. But, uh, you know, fast forward four and a half years ago, uh, I'm healthy. Your mom's healthy. The kids are much older. Our oldest is driving. So you can, uh, you got, you know, you got some time uh, being, being coming back that can be allotted to you and building a business. Get and, that umbrella uh, and insurance policy. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Unfortunately, your dad passed away. So 
uh, you know, it was really just helping support her. It was a passion of hers. And uh, I was working as senior advisor to the GM in Florida at the time and helping her build out the, the business plan and, and make some connections and whatnot. And uh, I was always the guy that set up the golf trips, the fishing trips, the Super Bowl pool, the Masters pool, and kind of quasi event planner, if you will. And, and really started to enjoy just the happiness that is extended through hospitality and talking to people and just the joy. I mean, sports, when you're invested and involved in it is pretty miserable. <laughs> like it, it is pretty negative. Uh, you know, only one team wins a year. So you're broken hearted. You're, you know, it's, it's just doing it for 30 plus years and being told where to go, what to do, how to do it. This was such a, a change of pace and, and a passion because knowing what we know, what we've experienced, you know, our niche clients are athletes, entertainers, CEOs, business owners. And, and when you look at that niche clientele, our, our unique ability to understand the demands in their time, the pressures of the job, the fame, the fortune, the stress on home life, the pressure on kids, uh, you know, all of that stuff is, is we've been through it. We understand it. Uh, so for us, when we're talking to our clients, we really get to know them on a much more personal level, asking questions to really kind of dig deep to figure out what they need, uh, you know, how best to where to steer them. And, and as my wife says, it's matchmaking for travel <laughs> I love and it. really getting a better feel for uh, how best we can advise them on where to go, what to do, and uh, getting out in front of potential situations. If a CEO is feeling stressed out at work, uh, if they're having home life issues, kid issues, whatever it is, you know, we all go through things in life. Uh, you know, and obviously we're very open and upfront about our struggles and our successes and what we've been through both personally and professionally. And, you know, I think people appreciate that in this new social media age where everybody's got a filter and everybody lives a perfect life. Right. Uh, you know, we're pretty real about life's not being not perfect, but we'd like it to be. <laughs> yeah, that that's awesome. I mean, I love that you really got to live the life of your dreams. And now you're empowering Lauren to live the life of her dreams, but you're doing it with her, you're partnering with her. Uh, by the way, Chris, the event planner has a nice ring to it. I'm just throwing <laughs> that out there. All right. Uh, and I know it's, it's much bigger and better than that. But uh, you know, it's, it, it's kind of like a, a fun transition. Oh, what? So what did you used to do? Oh, I used to be a professional hockey player. What do you do now? I plan travel. I plan events. <laughs> you know, it's just such a big like night and day shift. But what's cool is you, you mentioned this earlier. And I think this is a really important point because most people aspire to be, uh, well, I should say m most athletic people um, and even some that are not, they aspire to be a professional athlete. And uh, the aspirations there, th there's so much like fanfare and notoriety in that. But what people don't understand is it's uh, it, the, the, gra the grass is definitely kind of greener because inside of that, it, it is, it's the hardest, gr most grueling work. Uh, you have this um, season that is a long season where you're not able to like travel or live life on your terms the way that you would want to in a lot of different, you know, uh, facets of it, being an athlete, not only is it an incredibly tough job, but it's a very restrictive job. Now for you, you've been able to reap the fruits of, of that now. And, and I'm sure today you'd say, Hey, this is great. A lot of people don't have the fruit that you have. And so they do that and they don't even have anything to show for it. And they learn later that, you know, their identity and everything's kind of tied into this one thing. I love that you can say, hey, I'm bigger than that. Um, or, you know, that that is just a facet or a compartment of who I am in my life. And I think that that's amazing. Um, and that today you have this freedom and this flexibility. But we have to be careful because anyone who has ever started a company knows that there are perks to starting a company. <laughs> There's lifestyle that can be associated but if you're not careful the business that you started for freedom and autonomy often can own you and strip your freedom and autonomy correct that's and that's the the juggling act that we go through and, yeah. and you know early on in in startup phase you you give up a little bit of that um 
but but in the long run, I think once we get past this COVID induced malaise we are in, <laughs> we'll uh, we'll get out of that and we'll be able to, uh, you know, we'll be able to get back to quasi um, quasi normal life and and be able to grow. And I think we've started to put in steps as to how to manage time and, and set up your calendar in a certain way to be able to read good books and, you know, learn and do the things that I've been able to do to, to kind of keep your sanity and, and, you know, not just be one particular person, so to speak. Oh, Hey, that's the travel guy or, Oh, that's the athlete or, Oh, that's no, that's Chris Pronger or that's Justin Donald. And here's, here's pieces of what they do and and you continually add pieces to the deck and and build out your persona build out your life build out how you want to live um so it, it's really just about understanding who you are what you're all about uh being comfortable you know i would say early on in my career i was not very comfortable i didn't like people staring i didn't like you know, just because they're like, oh, there's so-and-so the hockey player. And I just did not like people staring at me. And, you know, as you get a little bit older and you get a little bit more comfortable in your skin and you just kind of, oh, well, it is what it is. And you were able to kind of let go of it and, and uh, you know, not let it bother you anymore. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And you bring up another good point, which is that so many people live this one-dimensional life, but we're not one-dimensional. We are multi-dimensional. And uh, I think that you intertwine that very well. And I love seeing the stage of life that you're at today. So now you're the entrepreneur, you're a partner, you and Lauren are building a business, you're doing great things there. But then on the side of that, you're an investor. And you've had some great uh, realizations here, investing as this is a component, a uh, part of the multi-dimensional you. And I'd love to learn just some of the, the wisdom that you've experienced and, and glean from you, uh, just whatever you want to share in this world of investing, because you've been doing it for a while, um, but you kind of had your hands on it, even when you were a hockey player, like you, you would, uh, it wasn't like someone was managing everything for you. You, you were, uh, you had a grip on it. I remember talking to you about that, where it's like, I'm not blindly going into stuff. I'm going to be involved in anything that we invest in. And now today you have more time to be able to look at it. And uh, I'd love to know some of these, uh, th these lessons, these words of wisdom that you've experienced. Yeah. I would say first, as you talked about athletes, you know, to the ones that run into the, the biggest problems are the ones that sign over power of attorney. Therefore, they have no say. Somebody can just randomly and blindly do whatever they want with their money. Uh, that's where I think a lot of athletes go awry. And that's common. Um, that's the scary yeah, thing. Yeah, that's, that's quite common, common. Which, which is crazy in today's day and age that people still do that, but whatever. Um, you know, I think for me, just like sports and life, my, my biggest and, and most valuable lessons are, are the are the losses <laughs> mm -hmm. you know you make investments you lose money you realize okay what didn't go, what what did not go right where what did i miss uh and then as you kind of extract and, and and look back on how the deal came together what you did you know and you kind of learn i i began to create with my financial advisor you know kind of parameters for each deal and what each deal needs to have to ha has to have in it in order for it to pass the stress test or the smell test that it's legit and real and something that we're interested in and yeah you're going to pass up great deals but you're going to pass up a lot of stinkers and and really you know as we talked about um you know in my portfolio defense and and in life i already hit my home run i i already had my home run and, and really it's about hitting singles and doubles. And in the process, you might hit a triple, you might hit a home run, but if you're hitting singles and doubles and you've already hit a home run, what does it matter? So, uh, you know, whether it's a, somebody with a company that sells and has a huge exit, you know, I had a huge exit. I'm all, I'm all set. And, and really it's about living within your means and living a lifestyle that you're comfortable with, but under the guise that you know how much money you have, you know what your investable assets are, and you know 
um, how, how to live your lifestyle with, within that. And uh, as it relates to athletes that you talked about earlier, it's just a matter of, as I was getting towards the second half of my career, it was really managing and understanding how much you can spend, how much needs to keep going back into the pot <laughs> to keep growing it so that it's not going the other way. And, and really just managing, you know, the spend and managing what you're putting out there. And then from there, uh, reinvesting and, and doing all the things that, that most smart investors do, but uh, understanding uh, and keeping the invest the investments that you're looking at, you know, if, if you're not a real estate guy, but you're interested in real estate, find a real estate guy that, or a real estate company that you trust that you can invest in their deals. You know, we've done that. Find uh, hedge funds or private equity that you're interested in, invest in those. Find, you know, and really it's about doing your due diligence and looking into companies and, and getting introductions to people and, and things like that uh, to, to really just talk to people and learn more about what they do and be interested. You know, I think one of the biggest things for me is, is, you know, I was, I believe it or not, very introverted. <laughs> and <laughs> that is shocking. Uh, and I will I, tell you that is very shocking. I've, I've used probably the last eight or nine years since I retired to, to learn more about how to, talk to people, how to ask questions, how to learn from, from talking to people. And just, again, being a sponge, being a fly on the wall and listening, taking it in, don't ask a question and then immediately start thinking, well, what's my next question? Listen to what somebody's saying to you, take it all in and then form a question or opinion based on what you just heard. And, and I think too often people are too geeked up to they got the list of questions here and they just want to start asking questions as opposed to yeah you might have a list but let the conversation go to wherever the next question might take it yeah you had so many great points there uh so many words of of wisdom and one of the things that i learned from tony robbins and this was very profound for me when i kind of got into this is that you're generally moving towards and away from something. So there's, you know, kind of like you're towards goals or values, and then you're away from. And, um, you know, pleasure and pain kind of fall in that. You're moving towards pleasure, but you're moving away from pain. And so you made the point that everyone loses at some point in time. And there are lessons to be learned inside of that. There's no doubt about it. Um, there is the pleasure of making money and getting a good return. That feels good. But I can assure you the lessons learned from that pale in comparison to the lessons learned from the pain of losing money. That is one of the most painful experiences, oh, yeah. especially at the beginning, especially when you don't have a lot of it, especially when uh, it's, it goes completely different than what you would have thought your, your expectations, the gap between expectations and reality is a, a huge, <laughs> you know, chasm. Yeah. And so, you know, we both experienced this. I've been very open about many of my losses. In fact, I wrote about one in, in my book, um, because I want people to know that that's normal, that, that, that happens. And, but those are great opportunities to, to learn and grow. And so, uh, I like that you're almost the only ways to learn. Yes. Yes. Personal loss. I can tell you when I turned pro, my roommate, my defense partner, and I guess my mentor was brought in to, to do all those things. He was, I was 18. He was 36. We'd sit around at dinner. You know, we used to do dinners and all that stuff on the road. Everything that he told me when I was 18, as I went on in my career and, oh, this is going to happen. This is going to happen. You need, you know, everything to a T came, came true. And of course I'm 18 going, yeah, 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 yeah. You got to make the mistakes yourself. You know, some of them I, I took and like, okay, I get it. And some of them like, yeah, yeah, whatever. <laughs> and then I got to his age and I was playing, teaching 18 year, 19 year olds, the same thing. And I'm sitting there going, I mean, it is amazing that you have to experience it on your own. You have to have the, the hard losses, if you will, to, to learn that valued mistake and then put in the right guardrails and parameters to make sure that you don't make those same mistakes. 
Totally. And you made another profound point, which is I had my big exit and I don't need any home runs. All I need are singles and doubles. And uh, I, I, what I want to do is I want to capitalize on that because I know a lot of people that have exited their business or have made a ton as a professional athlete. And, you know, the, they walked away just with a ton of cash. But I, I know a lot of people that have lost that money. I know many people that have made nine figures. They've made over $100 million. Okay. And many of them well into hundreds of millions of dollars. Okay. I know many people that have lost almost all of it. And it's because there's a big gap between being an entrepreneur, being an investor, or being a professional and being an investor. But there's also this uh, feeling sometimes that people get where they have to hit a home run with everything that they do. And that's just not the case. Uh, and, and by the way, I'm the exact opposite of you, Chris. I didn't have a big exit. I didn't have the big, you know, payday or, you know, selling a company or anything like that. So for me, um, I didn't have like a, a big pot of capital to start with. I had to singles, you know, hit the singles and hit the doubles to get to where I'm at. Um, and so there's value on both sides, but I, I hope that, you know, people listening here and people watching this show recognize it doesn't matter where you are. You, you could have had a big exit. You might not have had a big exit. You might be working a corporate job, uh, you know, barely getting by, or you might be crushing it and exceeding all the competition, but you can hit singles and doubles today and those singles and doubles can grow. So what a single and double is, you know, 10 years ago might be different than today might be different than 10 years later, but you hit the nail on the head with the fact that you don't have to take on the risk. You just exactly. need to not lose money, lose Correct. it enough to learn the lessons and then stop losing it. <laughs> That's it. That's it. And, and understanding where you went awry and, and fixing that. And then, to your point, it's like gambling. If you're going to gamble in Vegas or wherever you're going, you're, you bring the amount of money you're willing to lose. That's it. Yep. It's, it's no different than an investment. If you're making an investment, you better be willing to lose that amount of money, which is why people don't invest. If you're worth $10 million, you don't invest $10 million in one specific investment. Yep. You know, it's... Uh, you know, hence diversification. And, and that's why people write books and all this stuff because it works. Yeah. And the, the other thing is you'll see people that grip and hold on to their money so tight, they can't <laughs> let it go. And that <laughs> scarcity mindset, like holds them back from investing. I know, you know, people just like that, right? <laughs> yeah. That's exactly what it is. It's like, I'm just going to hold this thing. And um, th it's such a disservice because how are you going to make money? How are you going to capitalize? How are you going to create a return when you're so fearful of losing it? And so I think this mindset of abundance is saying, hey, uh, I'm going to risk what I can afford to lose. But at the same time, I'm probably not going to make anything if it just sits there. So why don't I do my best due diligence? Why don't I talk to people that I know they're successful, see what they think about this? Why don't I just do the investments that other successful people I know are doing? And then have the mindset of, I can make more money. I'm yeah. going to invest this. I, ho I hope that this goes well. If it doesn't, um, it's, it's not, you know, such an egregious investment that it's going to like put me out on the streets. Um, but I can always make more money. I can always work hard. I can always figure it out. And I think when you come from that standpoint, it's just easier to make investments. It's easier to let go of the money because it's not, you're not putting the money on a pedestal. And I think you have to have a long-term thought analysis to the investments that you have. I'm going to yep. tell you a quick story. 2008, that beautiful time in life, 07, 08, when the market went down a ridiculous amount, the market was at the bottom that year at 6,300. And I don't know, whatever it's at now, 40,000 or whatever it's right. at. It was at 6,300. A friend of mine I was talking to was losing his marbles, losing his marbles. It got to like 6,700. And he's like, well, what are you doing? What are you doing? Are you selling? I'm like, I'm not selling. Uh, why would I sell? I go, I don't, I don't need that money. Uh, do you need your money? Do you need that money right now? No. I go, why would you sell? It's going to go back up. Are you like, do you need it in a year and two years? It's like, no. I go, well, then this is going to be gone. It's going to go back up and you'll be fine. He couldn't take the stress of dealing with it. Sold at 6,700. 
Ooh. The bottom was 63, and then it, boom, spiked back again. That's rough. Yeah, it, emotions generally steer you the wrong direction in the world of investing. Uh, and I also find that when you make decisions out of fear, not from a place of strength, uh, they generally don't serve you as well. And so anytime you can feel your emotional, try to not make decisions, try to get into a place with, with you know, where you're calm, where you have peace, where you're standing from strength, uh, because those generally are going to turn out better. You know, facts. Yes. Facts. Yes. Chris, this has been incredible. I just have loved our time. And by the way, I just appreciate our friendship. It has been so much fun getting to know you and hearing your world travels and hearing these fun stories with you and different, you know, athletes. And, uh, it has just been a pleasure. So I've got to thank you for joining me today. And um, I, I'd love to have you share where our audience can learn more about you. Yeah, they can go to uh, wellinspiredtravels.com. Uh, they can go. I'm, I'm now on Twitter. All Chris right. Pronger, at Chris Pronger. Uh, I'm on Instagram at the Chris Pronger. Uh, well Inspired Travels on uh, Instagram. And uh, that's about all I got for platforms. <laughs> what a great name. Well Inspired Travels. I absolutely love it. Uh, I'd love to end this episode the way I end them all, which is this. What is one step that you can take today towards financial freedom and towards the life that you desire, a life that you dream of, a life by design, not by default? What's one thing you can do today to achieve that goal? Thanks so much for joining us, and we'll catch you next week.